I am Mark Greenberg. I'm the director of the Florida Studies Center. I'm not sure I've been able to say that yet on tape. We're, we've uh, moved on. The Resource Center for Florida History and Politics is now the Florida Studies Center. And I'm Good. again with Congressman Sam Gibbons. And we're continuing our, our journey together through his life. Um, <laughs> Well, it's a long life, and so it's a long journey. And uh, Mark, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back and just go back to D-Day again and try to put it in significance as to what was actually accomplished that day. I tell a lot of vignettes, and I get so tired, so tied up in telling those vignettes that I forget to, you know, look back and tell you what significance it was. Remember, I was dropped in the wrong place, about six miles from where I should have been. Uh, I was by myself until I started picking up uh, other members of the 501, mainly. But I even got some 82nd guys with me, too. And um, what we did was not an isolated instance, because what we did was we took control of the main highway that ran between Paris and Cherbourg. And it was the one that split right through the middle of the area of combat that we were uh, engaged in. And we took control of that and denied its use to the Germans, oh, all D-Day, frankly. Uh, from daylight until dark, uh, they could not use that road without uh, running into us and, and being denied the use of the road by our defense of it. So I think that's... It, it's very significant because that was one of the objectives of the 4th Division getting across the beach when it landed was to try to reach that road so that they could uh, cut uh, off any German movement up and down that road. Uh, the Germans must move up and down the road because the, the fields were so badly cut up that you couldn't really uh, make much progress going through the fields, so you had to go through the roads and uh, our control of the roads was a significant part and I think really contributed a lot to the success of D-Day. But, uh, you know, only history will tell. There were lots of other <laughs> actions that, uh, that contributed to the success of D-Day, but that was our contribution. Now, uh, Martha and I have just returned from going over uh, the mayor and the city council of uh, St. Marie du Mont invited us over uh, as their guest. Uh, to dedicate a plaque to the 101st Airborne Division. St. Marie de Mont was a little town about uh, a mile and a half behind the beaches, uh, and it had to be uh, secured in order so that you could open up the beaches from the rear, which was another one of our missions. And uh, they uh, uh, cast around and asked me to come over and dedicate a plaque. And so on June the 5th, uh, in a cold, drizzly evening, uh, we dedicated a plaque on the city hall, a nice, big, beautiful bronze plaque to uh, the liberators of the St. Marie de Mont on June the 6th uh, uh, by the 101st Airborne Division. So it was, it was a, you know, we got to see a lot of old friends and, and uh, retrace a lot of the areas that we'd been in. Um, it's beginning to change now more than ever, uh, but, uh, you know, it's amazing that uh, here, almost 58 years, 58 years after D-Day, the area looked pretty much the same. Yeah. Let me ask you, what's the fascination, do you think, with D-Day? There's a D-Day museum in New Orleans now. There have been several movies, an HBO television series. Of all military battles, I think, in the last several hundred years, maybe Waterloo is the only other one I can think of that seems to capture the imagination as much. Of the, of the public? Well, the historians that I read uh, mark it as a turning point in history, a significant point. Uh, uh, the Germans had control of all of the continent of Europe uh, and uh, had been persecuting or prosecuting a very successful war up to that time. At least they were in the position where they could have sued for peace and, and gotten a tremendous amount of, of uh, political control of Europe uh, out of it, or they could have somehow pursued uh, their course and been victorious. But D-Day was a turning point. Once we got hold of a maneuver space uh, on the continent of Europe from the west, uh, 
the fate of, of, of that war was uh, was fixed. And so it was a turning point in Europe. You know, D-Day was not one of those days that went exactly as planned, certainly by a long shot. There were some terrible uh, uh, mistakes that came about. Uh, the bombing was not accurate. Uh, the, our Navy gunfire was not accurate. Uh, the uh, beaches at Omaha were more heavily defended than thought. The area that we landed in was more heavily defended than we thought. And uh, we began to pick that up of, in aerial photographs just hours before uh, uh, the actual uh, launching of the invasion. Uh, we had had some premonitions of what could happen by our practices in England for this in night drops. We knew that there would be a, a, a maximum amount of, of confusion uh, just by dropping at night. But when you add uh, our anti-aircraft fire and small arms fire to, uh, to all of that, uh, the confusion was pretty high. And it was remarkable that it worked out as well as it did. I think it reflects the, the value of, of good training. Uh, as I've said many times, what is so remarkable to me is that the American soldiers, particularly those who participated in D-Day, were excellently trained. And their training came through, and uh, their, uh, it, their heritage showed through in all of that. So it, it, it's a significant day in, in world history. Uh, you want to go now to... Uh, yeah. Well, let's see. We'll skip ahead. We're about, about ready to run for office in 1952. <laughs> you, are. you are. Well, Just to backtrack, tell me a little bit about the practice of law just, you know, in the early 50s. And how does the practice of law and your thinking about your career affect the decision to run for office? Why run for office? Was the law career moving in a certain direction that made that logical? Or were there other issues involved? No, it, uh, the law career was developing successfully. My father and his brothers and my grandfather had a had an excellent practice uh, that I, uh, my brother and I walked into, and uh, uh, there weren't many new lawyers. We were a couple of the first that had graduated from school in years, and uh, the law firms around Tampa were looking for more lawyers and. Uh, you know, we had a good time uh, referring our colleagues to the different law firms uh, as they would graduate from school. Um, but uh, we were beginning to increase our earnings uh, and paying our way and making a little money for the firm. And uh, I was very happy in the law practice. Uh, and I, But at the same time, my brother and I had been, both been active in civic affairs. My brother even more active than I had been. and. Uh, but, um, oh, come about February 1952, a group of Tampa citizens uh, headed by Cody Fowler, who Fowler Avenue is named for his mother, not for Cody. Uh, and uh, he was a prominent Tampa lawyer, uh, president of the American Bar Association, uh, a lifelong friend of the Gibbons family, and a lifelong friend of mine. And he was meeting with other Tampa leaders and they wanted to promote someone for the state legislature and they picked me. Uh, and uh, I got to say that John Germany, um, who was my good personal friend and his wife Mary Ellen, and uh, oh, a lot of people uh, played a significant role in all of that. Uh, I had no political organization. I had really not done anything, and he had any experience in political organization. And they helped me put together a, a winning campaign. What was it? What did they see in you? Oh, I don't know. I guess I had a good military record, and I had a good family. And they figured, well, he's got a good family. He's not going to embarrass them, and he won't embarrass hmm. us. And, and uh, he hadn't got any significant trouble in going through school around here or going through the University of Florida or law school and everything. So 
they said, you know, he's a good, safe uh, candidate, and uh, uh, he's. We've watched him, and he's one that we'd like to back, and and they did. The big issue at that time was the expansion of the corporate limits of the city of Tampa. The city of Tampa had grown from the time my grandfather came here from about oh a thousand folk to uh, about a hundred thousand or hundred twenty thousand, and uh, its boundaries had not been changed in about twenty or thirty years. And the changing of those boundaries had become a political uh, issue. Uh, uh, the, those who were against it were vocally against it, uh, and they had good reasons to be against it, and there were other people who were for it. And uh, I chose the side of being for the ex extension of the corporate limits of Tampa. Now, what was at stake? What were the political issues that made it a hot potato? Well. Uh, your local taxes were one thing, uh, but I saw it more significantly than that. I thought it was a matter of you had to have a central core city uh, and you had to have good leadership. Much of the leadership that would have served the city of Tampa was then, by that time living outside the corporate limits uh, in, in all areas, but mainly in the Interbay area or the, the area south of, uh, of uh, what we now call Kennedy Boulevard, uh, and and uh, that area was rapidly growing, and many people had been moving out there for 20 or 30 years, and so a lot of the people who would have, who had businesses in Tampa, who uh, were interested in Tampa's future, couldn't participate in the political campaigns as voters because they just didn't live inside the city. For instance. <laughs> I was born inside the city. I lived inside the city till I was about six years old, and I hadn't lived inside the city uh, for oh many many years. Um, uh, we lived a couple of blocks past the city limits. I, you know, it first dawned on me when my father had a was riding to work with one of our neighbors and and had an automobile wreck on the corner of Howard Avenue and Morrison, and he was riding, the, the, the city boundary divided right down the middle of Howard Avenue. He was riding inside the city. He got hit by a car coming from the east on Morrison. He, uh, the car that he was in spun around, turned over, spilled open, and he ended up in a grocery store outside the city. And I remember uh, uh, the problems we had in getting to decide which police department was going to investigate the collision and things of that sort. And that's the first time I had uh, really focused on the city boundaries. And I was about, oh, I guess 13 or 14 years old when that happened. Uh, but the extension of the corporate limits of the city of Tampa were important for the growth of the city, for the political development of the city, and for its governance. And yes, there was a matter of whether your taxes would increase or not. That was always important to voters. And uh, the fire protection wasn't very good outside the city. Uh, there were lots of little quasi-governments springing up around there, fire control districts, lighting districts, uh, sanitary districts, uh, drainage districts, everything else. Little ad hoc pieces of uh, government that were growing up. I think there were about 16 or 18 of them. Hmm. Uh, scattered around the periphery of the city trying to perform different services. Uh, there was a different building code, uh, all kinds of things like that. There was no there was no zoning outside of the city limits of Tampa. And the city of Tampa had only had zoning for about 10 years and only very vigorously in the last five years of uh, before the election. So there were lots of things going on, but mainly the growth and expansion of the city, the giving Tampa some dynamics. And <clears throat> it, I took the side, well, the issue had gotten down to whether, what kind of, or whether there would be a referendum about expanding the corporate limits. Every time uh, they elected a member of the Florida dele legislative delegation, they got into the annexation issue. 
uh, the candidates were proposing all different kinds of referendum. I said, well, I'll be the referendum, and if I get elected, I'll expand the corporate limits. Uh, that was not a exceedingly popular position to take, and some interesting things happened during the campaign uh, that point that out. I had one opponent who was adamantly opposed to the expansion of the corporate limits and others who were kind of wishy-washy about how they would do it. But I had a position that I would be for the expansion of the corporate limits and that I would be the referendum. If I were elected, I would do it. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a pretty uh, big order to take on. Uh, and I guess uh, I might have been more cautious about making that decision had I realized how complicated it would be uh, to accomplish that. Well, after the election, uh, which turned on that subject uh, as to whether Tampa corporate limits ought to be extended with me for it uh, unequivocally and with others against it uh, except for a referendum or something like that. Okay, now, uh, now, now, this would have been the Democrat primary. This was the Democrat primary and a general election also. Who did you run against? I, in, 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 in the um, primary, there was Howard Garrett, a fine young lawyer. Uh, there was uh, uh, Harry Hobbs, another fine young lawyer. Uh, there was a Mr. Williams, of, uh, who was a lawyer uh, who lived out in the suburbs and who ultimately in the Democratic primary became my primary opponent. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, Tom Fairfield Brown, who was the head of the Republican Party here, ran against me. Uh, he was also a lawyer. Uh, so we had a, a lot of lawyers running, uh, and uh, I carried the first primary, and then the second primary I had Mr. Williams as my runoff uh, opponent, and so we had a clear-cut issue. He was diametrically opposed to the expansion of the corporate limits. I don't know what his plan was for governance of that area, but I was for expanding it. The mayor of Tampa, Curtis Hickson, uh, who I had known for a long time and was a friend of the family, took no part in that. Uh, he remained quiet, as did the city officials, and just kind of let us battle it out, uh, looking all the time about what would be the outcome. Well, in November, I finally defeated Tom Fairfield Brown and, uh, and, uh, and became the state representative. <sighs> By that time, I had begun to recognize the magnitude and the complexity of what I had promised to do, and I went to some of the city leaders, particularly a, a Mr. V. H. Northcutt, who was a, a president of the First National Bank, and said, "I need some legal help in all of this. I, I I am a lawyer, and I know what has to be done, but I haven't got time to do it all." We've got to set some reasonable boundaries that are legally defensible. And so we, we he, Mr. Northcutt got uh, some others together and they uh, pooled a little money and hired me a lawyer. Uh, his name was John Himes. John Himes uh, was a very fine uh, young lawyer, not as young as I, but he had had a lot more experience than I did. He'd been a the judge of the criminal court had done a real good job in that. He was an assistant attorney for the First National Bank, and he uh, he had he had a good clientele. His father had been a lawyer, and and he had a good clientele and was a good lawyer. And I was blessed that they did pick John Himes as my lawyer, help me uh, obtain him as a lawyer. And then I got uh, the, the city to get their zoning consultant uh, to sit down with me and to ride with me in my car around the city periphery and try to figure out where were the legal boundaries or where, how far we could place the legal boundaries and be on legally sound ground and also be on governmentally sound ground. And what were you looking for? What was the criteria you were thinking? Well, uh, the, the, under the law that the Supreme Court of Florida had enunciated that you, you could not annex uh, land that was not susceptible to city development. Uh, 
In other words, you couldn't go out and annex orange groves and, and cattle pastures and things like that. You had to have some kind of metropolitan buildup around it. Well, I was pretty familiar, having lived here all my life with the, the boundaries of, uh, of the extension of the state of civilization around the town, and I had some ideas in my own mind. But I got uh, with uh, Mr. Simmons, who was uh, who was a city planner from who lived in Jacksonville and had been provided by the city of Tampa to go with me and to drive around town and and look. He was well founded in city planning, and we were both reasonably well founded in what the law was, and. Uh, so we, uh, we, we drew a map. I can remember one day in December, 1952, in my little old Studebaker driving around town with uh, him in my car and a map that we'd gotten from one of the banks downtown because they were the only ones that passed out maps in those days of the city and uh, uh, tracing a, um, a potential boundary. Well, I, I wish I had still had that map because it's amazing how close to the the final boundary it became and the next day the newspapers began publishing my map on the front page and uh, and and the, the voices of uh, concern and criticism and suggestions began to swell and we made a small some small changes when things were called our month but 98 percent of the map remained unchanged uh, how, how did you move it through the legislature from, from that initial drive around <laughs> to making it happen? Well, then John Himes came into play, and John and I had a number of conferences about what needed to be done and how to get it done and how to comply with the Constitution, how to avoid lawsuits, how to avoid uh, successful challenges in the courts against the annexation. and. After he uh, studied it and thought about it for about two or three weeks, uh, we sat down and started putting it together. And we sat in his office in the First National Bank building, which was right below my office. And uh, he began to dictate to his secretary uh, the, um, the, uh, what be ultimately became the statute that was enacted by the Florida legislature. Uh, John was a good, careful lawyer, a smart lawyer, and he did a wonderful job in, in crafting all of that. Uh, he researched a lot of the other things that had been done. He researched the legislative history of these little service districts that had popped up all around the city of Tampa. We decided we'd, we'd just combine all those at the same time, abolish them, and, and take all those areas into the city. And uh, we, got this, we got engineers to work on the legal description of what would be the city boundaries. I knew a lot about uh, land titles, so I knew how to do the researching on that too, and and how to legally describe it. You didn't want to have a hiatus in the description, or the courts would throw it out and say it's vague and indefinite and you know, can't follow it. Uh, so we we spent oh weeks just working out a legal description of the land to be end up. In, in, in well, how did you get it past the legislature? Well, we're going to get to that. That that was the simpler part of it. <laughs> <laughs> the part of it was putting it together and putting it together in a way in which it would not fall by challenge by in the courts. And everybody, all the opponents, oh, we're going to challenge that. We're going to knock that one out. You know, it can't be done. You know, uh, So the more, uh, more of that kind of talk, the harder we work to get it right. Uh, it was a complex piece of legislation. Oh, less than a hundred pages of legislative work, but it was a lot of pages. And uh, it did a lot of things. It made a lot of changes in, in how Tampa was governed. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the things we did in a series of legislative accomplishments at that time was we abolished the, the, the white primary in the city of Tampa. Uh, Tampa had been set up as a segregated city. Uh, they had a white primary in which the blacks were first barred from participation and then 
after they broke through that bar were seriously discouraged from participating, and very few of them really participated in elections. But we got rid of that. We got rid of the fact that the um, offices in the city of Tampa were partisan offices and made them all nonpartisan, the mayor and the city council and all of that. Uh, we abolished the election machinery of the city of Tampa and consolidated all of it in the election machinery of Hillsborough County. Uh, we, well, I, you know, it, there were all kind of code things that we had to take into consideration, plumbing codes, building codes, uh, electrical codes, and, and all those. We had to go into all of those and make sure that they conformed and that we had a higher standard of all of that. So I guess I devoted most of the time until the time I got to Tallahassee just to making sure that the city of Tampa annexation was correctly done because I had run on that platform. I had said, well, if I get elected, I'll do it. And fortunately, that position was was adopted by other members of the legislature who had followed my race, particularly the ones who would have been important in this the local Hillsborough County delegation. Now at that time in 1952, there were three members of the House from Hillsborough County, and there were one senator. Uh, all of our districts were countywide. In other words, it ran from Oldsmar to through Plant City. It ran from Land of Lakes down to past Sun City, uh, and past Ruskin and all of that. Uh, we were all elected by the same constituency, and they fortunately uh, said, well, if Gibbons has made this kind of issue out of it and he's determined to do it, we'll go along. Uh, that removed a lot of the political problems I could have had. Senator John Branch was, was a state senator at that time, and he said, okay, Sam, you won that election, that issue's behind us, I'll go along with what you want to do. And the same with uh, Jim Moody from Plant City and, and Tom Johnson here in Tampa uh, said, okay, Gibbons has made his mind up, he's made an issue out of the thing, we're not going to stand in his way and let's, 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 let's go ahead and let him do it. Essentially in the state legislature, if I got unanimous local delegation support, by common courtesy, the others didn't oppose it. So uh, we went through all the legal steps we had to do, the advertising in the newspaper and all of that of the boundaries and of the proposed annexation uh, law, and and pulled all that together. And oh, oh, about 15 days into the session, the, the time limit on the, the advertising of all of it had run, and we put it together in a package. I introduced it in the House. Uh, minimal comment. Uh, people knew it was significant, but they didn't get in the way. It was, after all, it was Sam's decision, and he'd run on that platform. Why should we interfere? It's really not a Clearwater decision, or a Lakeland decision, or a Bradenton decision, or a Tallahassee decision. It's a Tampa decision, and the Tampa delegation, fortunately, uh, went along with me in that, and. So we, we passed it through the House and the Senate, in, I think, in one day. What's and that? then I had talked, by that time, the governor of Florida, uh, Dan McCarty, had had a serious heart attack. And he was really confined to the governor's mansion, uh, or the governor's shack, as it was deridingly called. It was about, it was shortly torn down. It was torn down shortly after that. Anyway. Dan McCarty was terribly sick. He was in bed in, 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 in his residence there. And his brother, uh, John McCarty, who I had known at the University of Florida, was actually governor de facto. He was running the office and, and running things out to his brother and getting you know his brother's consent and signatures where it was necessary. And so I asked Dan if he would take it out to the uh, governor's mansion and ask his brother to sign it and he nice said John. sure John excuse me that's John McCarty and so John took it out there that evening after we'd passed it through the house and the senate uh, took it to the governor the governor signed it and it was law bingo like that next day the paper's 
headlined it, and uh, and that was it. The mayor promised to carry out the intent of it, and he did. Uh, he as quickly as possible he expanded the police protection to the suburbs that had been annexed. He uh, uh, extended garbage collection. He extended uh, fire protection, uh, and he did all those things as rapidly as he could expand it, incorporating in some places the existing little governmental agencies that were being abolished uh, and the people who were involved in it. Uh, Sam, let me just ask, the business about the white primary, yeah. was that not a hot button issue for some folks? Did you have to deal with that in particular? You know, it was not a hot button issue. I think people had come to the conclusion that this white primary is a thing from, is an anachronism. Uh, the blacks had been able to penetrate it to some extent, but they were largely still discouraged from voting and the system was complex. Uh, I remember campaigning around uh, and I'd run into people and we'd get to talking about, you know, are you a registered voter? Oh yeah, and they'd pull out their city of Tampa voter registration thing. I said, well, are, are you registered in the county? Oh, oh no, I, I, I live inside the city. I'm I vote inside the city. Well, I said, would you can't vote for me or against me if you don't register in the county election machinery because I'm a state office and I'm running for a state office. I'm not running for a city office. Well, I got tired of explaining that to so many people, the nice people, and, uh, you know, uh, so I said, we might as well get rid of that confusion. Let's just get have one registration. If you live inside the city, and you register in the county, they're able to vote in the city, in city elections. Simple concept, it worked, and it's worked all these years since then. And the city has no more election machinery. Uh, and uh, the county runs the elections for them through the county state machinery. Did the number of blacks registering change as the result of... It began to step up, but the intimidation kept many fine blacks from uh, from registering. They had grown up in an era in which it had been very unpleasant and maybe slightly dangerous to <laughs> register and to vote. And but they were beginning to change. And of course, this this just getting rid of the black primary. Uh, I mean, the white primary. Uh, had a had a snowballing effect in in making sure that they they did begin to participate in their in their government. Uh, so there were lots of them that who would like to and who who um, who stepped forward to do that. So we're into what the early part of 52. 52, 52 yes. You've successfully annexed more city territory. About. As I recall, the city of Tampa's population when I started in, before annexation was about 120,000. When I finished, it was 250,000. And Tampa became the second largest city in the state. Uh, the city boundaries were extended about <laughs> like they were until this recent ex extensions that we're beginning now in the northeast up here. And, and uh, the boundary line ran down Fowler Avenue right outside the university until it got near the university and then there was the old Henderson Airfield over there and I think it, um, as we recall, we zigzagged through what was left of Henderson Airfield, not there was anything in, in there, uh, but uh, the, uh, and then went down, uh, oh, 46th Street as I recall. <laughs> And, and and down to what was Seven Mile Creek, which is now called Palm River, uh, and we it 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 really covered all of the in, well inhabited periphery of the city of Tampa, and so we finally had Tampa going in the right direction, everybody pulling together as a city, and it it, it made a lot of changes in the city leadership because people who had been just outsiders looking in now became participants in city affairs. They had a city council person and they had a mayor and they participated in the elections 
and they participated in the decision making more than they had in the past because they figured, well, now we're entitled to and we're responsible for it, then it's our city. And um, that, people tell me, has been probably one of the most significant things that happened to the city in, in that era uh, was the, the Tampa becoming a city, not just a little core with a huge suburb uh, going all over the place. What other legislative uh, initiatives did you get involved in in, the, in your first term? Well, I had so much going on the annexation that there were there were very little. We had to set salaries for county officials. We had to do uh, we we uh, pushed county. We pushed for zone, the adoption of zoning laws in the county. Uh, we got that done, and timidly the county commissioners began to extend zoning and planning into what had been the urban sprawl around Tampa or past that. And it, but it was, it, and there were little things for the Port Authority and things like that. But the most significant thing of the whole 50, 52, 53 session of the legislature was the city of Tampa annexation. Uh, toward the close of the session, Farris Bryant had, uh, who uh, was the Speaker of the House, uh, came down from the Speaker's chair and, and addressed the House and said, you know, Florida needs to look at its educational, higher educational facilities. And he introduced a resolution requiring a study of higher education. <clears throat> Nobody complained much about it. There were really three universities. There was the Florida A&M, which was not a uh, um, totally black school, but it was a co-educational school in Tallahassee. There was then Florida State University, which had only recently been Florida State College for Women at Tallahassee, and there was the University of Florida, which was by far the largest of the three. Most of the members of the legislature who had college educations had gone to the University of Florida. And we went along with Ferris's, after all, he was speaker and he was respected, a study of higher education. Uh, shortly after the session, I remember it was in the summertime, uh, the local newspapers, the Tampa Times and the Tampa Tribune, began running stories about uh, things that other delegations had gotten from the state of Florida in the in in the legislative session and uh, uh, and I was eating lunch with a group of people that I ate lunch with almost every day. We had a little luncheon <laughs> club uh, that met up in Moss Brothers Tea Room, uh, Moss Brothers Department Store down in the city, heart of the city of Tampa. Had a tea room. Uh, actually, it was a lunch room, but they called it a tea room. And we had a little table uh, that kept growing and by that time, there were about 20 or 25 of us at the height of lunch session would sit around this table, order, talk about different things, and football, baseball, politics, uh, everything else, family, uh, business. And they were kidding. Jim Moody and I were having lunch there with them. Uh, uh, Jim lived in Plant City, but he spent a lot of time in Tampa. Uh, he was assistant county attorney and a very smart and very fine person. We were having lunch there together and they got to kidding us. It was, we don't read that you and Moody and Johnson got anything for the city, for us around here. All these guys get these poultry inspection stations and these citrus stations and these highway patrol stations and things like that. What the heck did you all get for us? And so we, we, <laughs> we took it as good natured kidding. We, after lunch, we walked outside and sat on a street bench uh, right outside of Moss Brothers and began to talk and run over it and say, well, you know, maybe we better lay out an agenda of things we'd like to do uh, in the next session of the legislature, and that got us to thinking. At that time, I had been participating in a fundraising drive for the University of Tampa. Uh, the University of Tampa was founded in 1932 over there in the old plant park hotel and it had 
it had slowly but steadily and mainly slowly grown. It got a burst of students right after World War II with the GI Bill, and then by 1952 they were disappearing very rapidly, and the University of Tampa was in serious financial problems. And so they had a fundraising drive, and I was assigned an area of Tampa and went out and tried to raise money for them. Uh, nobody disliked the University of Tampa, but there weren't any people that were that interested. There weren't many people that were interested in contributing money to run a school for students down there that most of their families didn't attend anyway. There were quite a few Tampans, but not not of the moneyed class whose children attended Tampa U. Uh, so we, we fell very short of the goals of raising money for the University of Tampa, but I got, having been born on the campus of the University of Tampa, having had a grandparents that lived in what is now the campus of the University of Tampa, and having been around there and played there as a Boy Scout and everything else, I, I was very interested in all of it, and uh, and it, it, I kept thinking, well, what can we do to save the University of Tampa? And I hit upon the idea, well, let's, uh, let's convert the University of Tampa into a state institution. We'll use the area that's around it as a potential campus. We'll use the faculty members as a cadre. And all we've got to do is, you know, get the state in its support and his overall direction of the university. Well, some people thought that was a good idea. Other people thought, well, you know, it's not bad, Sam. I'll go along with it. But I pursued that, and I kept following the study of higher education that Ferris Bryant had set up. After the next election, uh, which was not much of an election for me, I, People said, we're going to beat you in the next election, Gibbons for Annex, and all of us without a referendum and all of that on it. On it. Well, nobody showed up to run except some fellow on the last day appeared at the election office up in Tallahassee and filed his papers, and uh, he never showed up. I still, I still have never laid eyes on my opponent. Uh, and... <laughs> Kind of a travesty, you know. I uh, I would uh, go to all these campaign rallies, and I would stand around waiting for my time to speak. And they usually put the members of the state legislature almost last. Uh, the sheriffs and people like that came first. Uh, and uh, it was hours of standing around and waiting, so that you could just get a little word in the Tampa Tribune and the Tampa Times about what your platform was and what you wanted to do and why you were running for re-election and things like that. Well, the headline's always, Phantom Candidate Fails to Appear. And then way down about the end of the story, Representative Gibbons, whose, candidate, whose opponent has, was not here at this rally, and the long thing about why you never had nobody ever seen him, where was he? <laughs> he was getting all the publicity. I'd get about one line of publicity. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't much of an election the next election. Uh, in, in, in 1953, there'd been all kind of people who were going to defeat me, but annexation went over well. And, and the transition... Uh, Unfortunately, the mayor died uh, during the, all that transition. He had a heart attack and died. And uh, But they had elections, and they elected representatives from the different areas to sit on the city council. And so it, and, and fire, p police, garbage, everything, everything else was being extended. Uh, zoning was being extended into those unincorporated, those in, newly incorporated areas. And, you know, uh, it, it, there was a feeling that, well, it may be controversial, but it's working at least. So I got by the next election without having to refight that battle, but because I had a phantom opponent who everybody thought would have, would tear me apart in the debates over what had been done, never showed up. I don't know where, what ever happened to that fella. Remember his name? His name was Williams, as I recall, 
but I, you know, you'd have to look at the records of the state to find out what it was. I, I, I think I knew where he lived. I drove by his house, but there was nobody ever there. Didn't look like it was inhabited. Uh, the residence from which he had said he lived, and we just, you know, ignored him. Uh, I didn't want to dig him up <laughs> and uh, uh, create problems that I didn't uh, have to face. Anyway, uh, we got reelected, and uh, I, as I say, I'd been through this experience with Tampa U. I had said, we, you know, we, we need a state university here. We got lots of people uh, whose children are now in elementary school and will soon be in second secondary schools and where in the dickens are they all going to school they all going to have to go and jump in cars and buses and go all the way up to Gainesville and Tallahassee to go to school why can't they go to school here locally uh, and that shortly after the election uh, Dr. Philip Hampton and Ralph Marsicano who was the city attorney uh, asked me to have lunch with them at uh, at the old university club and when I did uh, they said well Sam we think you ought to in the next legislature you ought to try to get that new medical school that they're going to build up at Gainesville uh, moved down here to Tampa and Dr. Hampton had a lot of good medical reasons why the medical school should be built here to Tampa so I said well I'll look at it when I get up there and do what I can well uh, it was that was a Feudal attempt. Uh, Bill Shands, who was the leader of the Florida Senate and who was a native of Gainesville and a and a senator from Gainesville, and uh, he controlled that agenda. And so I never did anything uh, about moving the med school from Gainesville to Tampa, except express some interest to some of the members that this may be the wise thing to do. Well, nobody paid any attention to that. But it, all of that got me to thinking about Tampa as the site of a new university. And so uh, one of the things I talked about in, in my election campaign was that Florida needed a new state university and that Tampa was a logical site. Uh, that didn't make many headlines. Uh, as I say, I was working on the the people who were in, responsible for the University of Tampa. I met with them individually in their offices. I met with them as a group. And I thought I had the votes lined up in the Board of Trustees of the University of Tampa to sub adopt a resolution saying that we would submit ourselves as a, as a cadre for a, a new state university. Well, the Supreme Court of the United States made a decision uh, uh, about that time saying that private institutions did not need to desegregate. Uh, desegregation had become a big issue and a political issue in Florida and all over the United States. And so the trustees of the University of Tampa said, well, everybody will flock to the University of Tampa because it doesn't have to desegregate. We don't have to admit blacks. And there'll be all these blacks in the state institutions and nobody will want to go there. Well, that was their thinking. And so when we got to the final vote, I didn't get enough votes on the Board of Trustees and that evaporated. But by that time, I had begun to think very seriously about what should be done. And early in the the 1955 session of the Florida legislature, the new speaker, Ted David from, from Fort Lauderdale, had appointed me chairman of the education committee. Uh, Jim Moody, who was the chairman of the appropriations committee of, of the, the state house of representatives, uh, and I was a member of his committee, he appointed me the chairman of the uh, Higher Education Committee of the State uh, uh, Appropriate of the House Appropriations Committee, and uh, so it began. Things the cards just began to fall together in all of this. Early in the session, I 
got drafted uh, a bill that put uh, very short, simple, one-page piece of legislation that in effect started off saying the State Board of Regents shall uh, investigate the desirability and feasibility of uh, creating a new state institution of higher learning in Hillsborough County. Note Hillsborough County. Uh, I, uh, surprising that there were not, wasn't a lot of opposition to that. The local delegation, Moody and Johnson, and, and by that time, Kicklider said, that's a good idea, let's, let's go with that. And we began to round up co-sponsors, and uh, we got a lot of co-sponsors to my legislation, and I introduced it, and it was referred to my committee. And I had enough respect on the committee so that after deliberate discussion about the desirability of creating a new state institution in Hillsborough County, the committee approved it, went to the House floor. Uh, I got in a battle with the Pinellas delegation because they wanted to strike out Hillsborough and add the Tampa Bay area in there. And I said, no, we can't do that. And the members of the legislature knew why we couldn't do that. And why was that? Well, it was very simple. There were only three Republicans in the Florida House of Representatives. Those were the three from Pinellas County. They were treated humanely, but not with any great respect or voice in the legislature. Uh, and when they got up and tried to amend my bill, uh, uh, after a little spirited speech by me and a couple of others. Uh, the House voted and very heavily decided that it ought to be just Hillsborough County. And you, you, the language was Hillsborough County, Hillsborough no, County, not the city of Tampa. No, Hillsborough County. So it was that language that yeah. was intended then to say, well, the University of Tampa is out of the picture. Now. Well, no, the University of Tampa had just taken itself out of the well. picture, and it was not, it was no longer a contention. Uh, but the other thing was that, had you ever considered a, a more downtown location? Well, I would love to have had it downtown because I saw an opportunity for students to get jobs downtown mm -hmm. and to get into not only academic education, but they could get some practical experience as they went along. Architects, engineers, lawyers, uh, business people, uh, doctors, everything else. You know, there were all kinds of opportunities downtown that didn't, but. But, you know, uh, Hillsborough County included Tampa, so Tampa wasn't excluded, but the, the University of Tampa site had, for all practical purposes, been excluded by the refusal of the Board of Trustees to go along with the idea. Uh, and Pinellas had been defeated on the House floor uh, by trying to put it, expand it so that Pinellas could be considered. And I, I, I thought, you know, I've got to get money for this university. I've got to get it approved. Uh, if I put it in, if it looks like it's going in Pine House County, the Florida legislature is not going to pay much attention to those three Republicans sitting on the back row back there. And I won't be able to get any money for it. And <clears throat> so that was the simple issue. Uh, there was no particular love for Hillsborough over Pine Ellis, except that Pine Ellis had three Republicans. And the legislature was entirely Democratic except for them. And as I say, they got respectful uh, hearings, but uh, not very sympathetic hearings on their on their positions. Uh, anyway, um, the legislation passed. Uh, uh, the Governor Collins had been elected to fill the vacancy that had been created by the death of Dan McCarty. And John Germany, uh, who had been my first campaign manager and who had gotten me interested in running for the state legislature, had served Governor Collins in this area during his election. Governor Collins liked him and asked him to come to Tallahassee and be his legislative assistant. And so John was up there and his wife and uh, Martha and our children were up there and we were very close friends and I worked uh, very close with uh, with uh, John and all of this in getting the governor to approve uh, 
this uh, this university. The, the governor had some doubts as to whether Florida could afford or needed or a uh, new university. After all, he had represented uh, Tallahassee in the state legislature for many years very effectively and very well. And he was kind of committed to FSU. Then with the University of Florida crowd uh, not being gung-ho for all of this, uh, there was an uphill uh, climb. How did you rally the, the necessary support? How did you make the case? Well, after having overcome the, the attempt by the Pinellas delegation, there was enough kind of team spirit around there. Well, we got to help Sam get this done, and and that occurred, and the vote to to uh, all of all of which is spelled out in that volume that I've got over there. Uh, every step of the way, uh, that Journal of the Florida House of Representatives uh, spells out in great detail the legislation, the votes, the. Uh, steps it went through and finally to the governor's approval and it becoming law. John helped with the governor's Yeah, John helped with the governor's decision, which I don't I think the governor could have vetoed it. Uh, it could have gotten lost in the Senate, but it didn't. And I, 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 I think there was a general consensus that, yeah, you know, maybe we ought to look at this thing of what we're going to do about it as Florida grows. Florida was just beginning to grow. Hillsborough was growing faster than, and Pinellas were growing faster than other places, but uh, uh, Miami had grown like the Dickens. Miami had the University of Miami, so they didn't want a state institution down there competing with it. And there was real concern in my mind about whether Tampa U would survive, but the folks that were running Tampa U thought, well, Tampa U is going to survive despite the fact that <laughs> Sam's trying to bring a state university here uh, uh, to compete against it. That was very wonderful of Tampa U folks to take that attitude, and I've always been grateful because if I'd had their opposition, I don't think I would ever have accomplished what we were able to do. But the study of higher education became more interested, and, and, and uh, we, the man who was conducting the study for the Board of Control, which is now similar to the Board of Regents, it was, had, it was smaller and had a different name, but it had roughly the same powers as the Board of Regents had. And they uh, they were doing a good workmanlike job of, uh, they had hired consultants and things of that sort to come in and help them. And a, a fellow named Dr. Myron Blee, who had been head of the Legislative Council of Florida, a, uh, an employee of the state legislature of the House. Uh, was working for the Board of Control. He was a Ph.D. and he had good background and he was a good friend of Governor Bryant, Ferris Bryant, who was then a former speaker. And uh, and I had known him during the 55, the 52 and 55 sessions of the legislature and I began to work with him on the study. I appeared at the first Board of Control meeting in September of 1955 uh, in Gainesville at the law school up there. And uh, at the end of the, their formal business, they said, well, uh, Representative uh, Sam Gibbons of Hillsborough is here and with his lovely wife, Martha, and uh, uh, would he like to address the board? And I got up and called the board's attention uh, uh, to the fact that the legislature had passed this Enabling Act directing them to conduct a study as to the desirability and the feasibility of establishing a state institution in Hillsborough County. And they thanked me very kindly. And I remember walking back after my little address and sitting right there along the aisle was John Allen, who was then the acting president of the University of, of Florida and who was to become the president of this institution. And he smiled at me, and Mrs. Allen smiled and nodded at me, and uh, and, and I guess they thought I was off on a wild goose chase, but uh, the chase uh, developed, and I became a permanent resident of the Board of Control's meetings after that. Uh, we had been good friends because I had been handling his appropriations and talking uh, uh, to his people and talking to the new uh, 
dean of the med school up at Tallahassee and up at Gainesville. And of course, they were just in the middle of beginning to put together the med school at that time. Anyway, uh, when I got back to Tampa, Moth and I drove back that evening and, and uh, I pondered over it all weekend. And then uh, about early in the week, I went around to say, you know, I got to have help with this thing. This is, this is big. It's doable. Uh, I've got to put together some kind of group of people who are interested. So the first person I went to see was Scott Christopher. Scott Christopher, unfortunately, is dead now, uh, but he was at that time uh, the new director of the uh, Greater Tampa Chamber of Commerce, and they had just moved into their new building, and Scott had, was doing a good job, and we knew each other and, and had been friends, not close friends, and I said, you know, we I, I called this legislation that I had gotten passed to his attention and gave him a copy of the legislation as, as passed and made law, and we talked about it. And he said, well, the, you know, Sam, we've got to get some kind of public relations campaign going. He said, uh, uh, Luis Benito, uh, who is the head of a, about a one-person advertising agency, is a member of our board of directors, and he is a good at public relations. I had known Luis Benito from the Junior Chamber of Commerce and had sort of followed his career. We were not strangers. And he said, why don't his, his office is over in the Tampa Theater building. Why don't you go over there and talk to Lewis and get him to help you put together a public relations campaign to get this issue elevated to where perhaps something could be made of it. So I went over to see Lewis and talked to him about it. He thought about it for a few days. And called me back and said, I've got some ideas, Sam. Let's sit down and talk them over. And he said, the first thing we need to do is to put together uh, the need picture. And I said, yes, that's highly important. It's, it's, it's a need picture that's gotten us to this stage, that there is a need for a new institution in Florida. In that same session of the legislature, after my bill establishing authorizing the establishment of what is now the University of South Florida, which was at that time called a four-year degree granting institution of higher learning. <laughs> that was its name and uh, in Hillsborough County. And uh, there were a couple of other members of my committee that say, hey, you know, give it, that's a good idea. Can we get one done for, for Palm Beach? So we did the Palm Beach one now Florida Atlantic. And then the delegation from uh, out in Pensacola, out in Escambia County said, hey, can we get, you know, we have to go 200 miles to just to get to Tallahassee and 300 and some miles just to get to Gainesville. Can we get one done for, for our end? So I said, sure. So we put together three of them, the University of South Florida, the University of the Florida Atlantic, they weren't named that, and, and the West Florida, all passed. South Florida first, a month or so later, Florida Atlantic, and a few weeks later, West Florida. And so by the time the legislature adjourned, there were authorizations for three state universities, all of which finally came into being. But the University of South Florida came into being long before the others did. And it's mainly because of the emphasis that was placed upon that by the Board of Control, Board of Regents study. And the fact that I wouldn't let them alone. <laughs> as I say, the Board of Regents finally uh, got to treating me as a ex officio member of their board. I attended so many of their meetings, and, and I was the chairman of the Higher Education Committee, and uh, they thought I was doing a good job. At least they told me I was in their area. And so we were friends, and it was working real well. But Luis Benito added the, and the Chamber of Commerce added the final punch, then that we began to put together a coalition that could support all this. When did the name get chosen? Oh, after the after John Allen had been named uh, president, uh, which was uh, in 1958. 
All right, I'll get to yeah. that. So right, so we'll cover that. We'll cover that. Anyway, uh, uh, getting around to all these uh, board of control meetings, which were held all over the state, uh, I was trying to practice law. I was trying to do a lot of other things. I was a reserve officer in the Army Reserve. I, I had more irons in the fire than you could handle. Uh, by that time, we had, two, we had two children. Uh, yeah, and there were lots of civic activities I was involved in. Lots of things were going on. It was a very wonderful, active time in my life. But we, we, uh, we, we, the interstate system was just really being considered by that time. And vague outlines of Interstate 4 and Interstate now 75 and 275 were beginning to emerge from the State Road Department. And we, we took the outlines of these roads and we made Tampa the central point and we drew roads from all over Florida leading into Tampa. And, uh, and we said that, you know, Tampa is a logical spot. That was the first part of our PR. There is, first of all, there's a need, and then we did the statistical analysis and our need as to what the population is now, what was already in schools and ready to go to college or potentially will go to college, and just extrapolating those figures, you could see this bulge coming down the road. And then with all the roads leading to Tampa, Tampa became the logical spot, and we put together maps, and finally we reduced this thing all to a booklet that uh, Luis Benito put together, and I said, well, Luis, uh, we got to get these in the hands of the right people. And he said, well, now I've got an idea, Sam. Let's make it so big that they can't put it in their filing cabinet, and it's so handsome that they'll want to put it on their desk. And the outside of the book will be in gold letters, Florida needs another four-year university, uh, and Tampa is the logical spot. So that, all in gold embossed on the outside of this uh, naugahyde bound uh, 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 little booklet uh, laying out the arguments uh, that we had developed, uh, Tampa being the logical spot and the need, uh, armed with that. And this was, I had been to two or three border control, border control meetings without that, and it just extemporaneously uh, gotten up and reminded them of the study and and Dr. Blee would be there and he would outline the study on higher education which was far broader than what I had been focusing on uh, and uh, but it dovetailed in together it began to show that there's a huge group of people that are going to have to be accommodated someplace and this Tampa is a logical spot and the gold bound book and everything else uh, <laughs> well, we were making quite a little splash. Well, I, uh, I, I was driving all the time trying to get these border control meetings and trying to practice law and trying to be a father and a husband and a reserve officer and everything else and also a candidate for the next election. Uh, so finally one day uh, at a meeting, uh, Mr. Paul Smith, uh, who was in, in the construction business here in Tampa and throughout the state said, well, Sam, uh, the company has an airplane and I, I, we have a pilot and if it'll help you any, uh, you can, and we're not using the plane, you can use the plane. Well, boy, that was a dream. So when they'd have meetings in Miami, I'd show up, uh, courtesy of Paul Smith plane or Jacksonville or uh, Tallahassee or Pensacola, Gibbons was there with his little spiel, and they were all nice to me and pleasant, and I had gotten to know all the Board of Control members very well over the years, and, and uh, we were almost like a family uh, by that time. And by that time, I was bringing them down to Tampa and showing them potential sites uh, whenever I could corral a few of them. And I... Uh, what were you showing them? Well, uh, I showed them downtown Tampa, but that wasn't of interest to them because they knew the land would be too expensive. They said, well, we can't buy land, Sam, so we're going to have to get the land somehow. 
so I began searching around for where can you get land and where can you get it for a reasonable cost. And, and it's, of course, it's got to be in Hillsborough County because that's what the enabling legislation said. It had to be in Hillsborough County. Well, the St. Pete Times uh, took up the cudgel over there and, and uh, for expanding it past Hillsborough County. They just ignored the fact that the legislation designated Hillsborough County. They just assumed that when the legislature got around to establishing this, they would consider other areas. And they wanted this Board of Regents, uh, the Board of Control, to uh, designate a, a spot in, in Pinellas County. They had a number of spots uh, designated over there. There were a number of spots beginning to be designated around here. Certain real estate owners who had large tracts were interested in getting it there. But this little jewel out here, uh, uh, known as Henderson Airport, uh, uh, it was not a functioning airport then, uh, it had uh, lay here. It had become surplus government property after World War II. It had been given by the federal government to the Board of County Commissioners, and they were grazing cows on it. They were leasing it out and grazing cows. And in looking around, I spotted this piece of land. And I remember one time, Moth and uh, we only had two sons at that time. We got on our old station wagon and came out here and drove all through this area. And I said, Moth, this is where the university is going to be. And she looked at me like, well, you know, you're dreaming, Sam. But there were just about a, maybe in this 1,000 acre tract that we've got here, there were about 100 cows. And they were about to starve to death because it was the grass was so <laughs> Poor and uh, uh, and the lake down here by 30th Street uh, uh, didn't have any water in it. I actually walked across it. Uh, it was so dry uh, in 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 the trip out here. And then we retreated to the other side of the Hillsborough River and had lunch and talked about what we had seen here. No gopher holes. Uh, gopher holes and scrub oh, oaks. Scrub and oaks. No pine trees. Uh, lots of palmettas uh, were beginning to grow. Uh, this had been an orange grove and had frozen during 1925 or 26 and had, other than having been an army airfield during World War II, had, had just lied, lain fallow. Uh, trees were beginning to replace the frozen orange trees and, and um, little, little oaks come up from uh, acorn droppings by squirrels and birds and things of that sort. That was about all there was out here, a lot of, a lot of weeds and grass. But it was a good place. There were no roads to the place. Fowler Avenue wasn't paved. It was paved partway, but oh, right as soon as you cross the railroad tracks, it was unpaved, just a sand road. 46th Street came up uh, to about where Fowler is now. It was paved. Uh, sort of, black top, narrow, uh, full of potholes. Uh, there were large remnants of the air base still there. Uh, and this beautiful, <laughs> desolate looking uh, sand pile out here uh, is now the main campus of the university. Uh, it was owned by the county commissioners. I talked to them. They said, oh, Sam, you sure if you get the university, we'll be glad to give you the land. For it, uh, we you know we we can't sell it to anybody. Nobody give us anything for it. Not what we think it's worth anyway. And uh, but the university, that's 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 a good project. So Ellsworth Simmons took uh, that under his wing, and he was chairman of the board of county commissioners, an excellent person to work with, and he got enthused uh, about it. There was a place out near the intersection of 301 and 60 uh, that some owners wanted to have a university. Uh, there was a place on Upper Tampa Bay, uh, out past town and country that some promoters wanted to have out there. And some people wanted to have it down toward the Port Tampa area. So I would kind of show the Board of Regents, the Board of Control, all the different places as they would come in town. And I always save this place to last. And I always approach through Temple Terrace. I never approached through downtown Sulphur Springs because it was a disaster in those days. Uh, it looked terrible. 
and I didn't want to drive a board of control member through that mess. <laughs> the people weren't a mess, but the buildings and everything else were, and and uh, and and get them out here to look at this site. Well, this site became interesting to the board of control members because it was a virgin piece of land, and the price of it, they knew we could get it from the county commissioners, and it, its developmental cost did to look real high. Well, all this time, the, the St. Pete Times, the St. Pete Chamber of Commerce, the Pinellas County was raising this big hullabaloo, and and when Nelson Pointer gets started on a on a on a campaign with his St. Pete Times, he can really make a lot of waves. Well, people got interested in more about whether there's going to be a state university than where it's going to be. They said, they, they, they said oh, it's got to be in Tampa. And other people said, oh, no, it's got to be on the other side of the bay. And people as far down as Sarasota wanted down there. People over in Orlando wanted. People all over the place wanted this institution, all of which I just kind of smiled and said, you know, it's designated to be in Hillsborough County. Uh, <laughs> that didn't discourage them. But it had a sanitary effect. The legislature finally got the hearing of all this racket that was being raised between the Tampa Tribune, the Tampa Times, and St. Pete Times, and the other newspapers, and the other promoters around the state about this new state university and, and uh, where it was going to be. They forgot to ask the question, is it going to be? So we sort of finessed the is it going to be, which was a big question I was worrying about was not is it going to be, but where is it going to be? Uh, and that made the, the, the whole battle of getting established a, a lot easier. I figured that, you know, we can, the legislation directs it to Hillsborough County, the Board of Control is studying Hillsborough County, uh, they're studying higher education, but they were, they were trying to, Board of Control was trying to be, you know, non-geographic and they were saying, oh, it could be here and it could be there. Well. All this hullabaloo was going on in the news media. It played a very interesting role. Then finally the governor got into it and said, well, it's, we're going to have a new state university. It's got to be on water. Well, not much water around this site here. Martha got on the telephone calling the newspapers, and it was Sunday morning. We had to beat that thing. We had votes coming up soon in the board of control and votes coming up, we hoped, in the Board of Education to establish the university. And the the, no, on, on, on Monday morning, well, the Sunday morning paper had the governor calling. It says this guy, we got to have water. We got to have, it's got to be on water. Well, I knew that shot this site in the, the foot, and that made every development of every other site very expensive uh, because they were low. One of them was over there where the Carillion Center is now in, 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 in Pinellas County. Uh, one of them was Albert Witted Airport. Uh, uh, small place, but, you know, sizable. Uh, and one of them was on Upper Tampa Bay. One was out at uh, uh, near Brandon. Uh, and then there were all these outlying cities coming in wanting the, this university, which had never really been established. Well, the hullabaloo about where really finessed the argument about whether. And so that was a real blessing. Uh, it, the Board of Regents, the Board of Control, excuse me, was getting closer to a decision. Uh, this was probably in September, I would think that the governor said it's got to be on water. By that time, he had gotten his voice in, in it. Uh, that to me meant someplace on Tampa Bay. Well, the St. Pete Times really went to cheerleading then. Uh, and I, I, Monday morning after this Sunday, last in the paper about having to be on water. 
I was walking out of my office in the First National Bank building and ran into a fellow I'd gone to law school with. And he said, Sam, I saw that article in the paper about the governor said it's got to be on water. And he said, I know you're considering this site out around uh, Temple Terrace out there. And he said, yeah, I've got some clients down in Miami, and, and they own a large tract of land, and they've got some stuff on the river. And he said, maybe if you talk to them, they'll give you four or five acres down on the river. Well, I was going down to the courthouse, so I walked down to the courthouse and went in to see Ellsworth. And I said, well, you know, will you follow this through, Ellsworth? I'm so busy with everything else. Uh, will you follow this through about the Miami land people, owners? Well, there was a fellow in there by the name of Stanton Sanson, Sampson. He had made a lot of money in the clothing industry uh, during the war, and he had retired from the clothing industry and had gone into the land development business. And he owned, and he with some other partners, owned all of this property that is north and east of, uh, of the university. Uh, so Ellsworth got to bargaining with them about uh, giving us a four or five acres down on the Hillsborough River. And Ellsworth is such a good bargainer, he got about 700 acres out of them. Of course, most of it is swamp, and he, but he had his four or five acres for the water. At least we could tell the governor you could get your feet wet uh, down at the river. And of course, there was some high land in it, which is now the golf course and other university developments over there. Uh, and so they threw in that piece of land, well, very quietly, uh, as Ellsworth was noted for working. He had to make a deal with those folks. Well, if they give you the land, they want something in return. So he, they said, well, we'd like to get a road into our property. Well, Ellsworth worked out a deal with them to extend 30th Street into what is now Bruce B. Downs Boulevard. Uh, and for that, for building the road into their property, uh, the county would get the title of the 670 acres largely in a swamp uh, to be the water proffer for the <laughs> governor for the university. Well, the, the governor was a good sport and he took our water and he dropped his campaign uh, for water. Uh, saying, well, it's been, you know, all the major sites now include water, so it's okay. He didn't say that. That's, in effect, what he said. He didn't say it exactly that way, but that was it. Uh, uh, the big, first big crucial meeting came uh, in Orlando. The State Board of Control was going to consider a report from the study people who had been studying the uh, higher education situation in Florida. And I had called it to their attention so many times that they had a little section in, the, in their report devoted to expanding the, the university system. And we got favorable mention in that. Well, by that time, the Tampa Chamber of Commerce had rallied, and Dick Saunders became, uh, who was the head of Southern Dairy Seal Test milk distributors, ice cream distributors here, was, was leading the charge. And we had about, oh, 20 or 30 members of the Chamber of Commerce who had formed a task force who were helping us with the lobbying and all of this. and because various ones of them knew different members that would help. Anyway, uh, the first big meeting that was to consider all this and was to take action on it was scheduled for Orlando in, I think, in October of 1957. And all the local communities had been given time to make a pitch. The different people had gotten on the border's uh, agenda, and, and I got the last position, which was the position I wanted to make the final argument, to make the final pitch. 
Well, the speaking at that Board of Regents uh, Board of Control meeting uh, went on for about three hours, and by the time I got ready to speak, those fellows had heard all they wanted to hear and more. And uh, I made my pitch, and shortly after that, they approved uh, the um, creation of a new state university to be at this site. Uh, they had been well informed. I had driven them out here. I had driven them all over this area. I had uh, lobbied them. The Tampa leaders had lobbied them. The St. Pete folks had lobbied them. The Orlando people had lobbied them. The Sarasota people had lobbied them. Everybody had lobbied them. They were up to their ears on this, and they wanted to get it behind them. So they designated this site. They designated this. The next thing came up, well, they couldn't establish a state university. The State Board of Education, under that enabling act that I'd gotten passed, had the power to establish the university. So we immediately turned our attention to the State Board of Education. That consisted of the governor, the state education commissioner, the controller of the state of Florida, the state treasurer, and the state the secretary of state, and the attorney general of Florida were the State Board of Education. Well. I started lobbying them. They were being lobbied by everybody else. They wanted, St. Pete wanted to overturn the border control's uh, designation of this site, and uh, we had a merry old time. Finally, uh, after a, a false start, the Board of Education signaled that they were ready to make a decision. Uh, you mentioned a false start. Well, they met every week. Uh, the Board of Control met every month. And one of the times I've been up there, I thought they were ready to make a decision and to move ahead. And I thought I had the votes. But I, they just got right up to the hitching post and then found some reason to postpone it. I, I think they needed some more information. The, <laughs> St. Pete Times had investigated me to, they knew I must have some connection to this site. They sicked all their investigative reporters on me and they searched me from stem to stern. And I said, well, if I've got any interest in it, I hope you'll find it because I, I don't know of any interest. I'd like to have an interest in it. <laughs> but they knew some member of the Gibbons family must have some interest in all of this or I wouldn't be as dedicated to the whole campaign as I had turned out to be. And, but they didn't find anything, and uh, they ran a few stories, but none of them amounted to anything. Everybody poo-pooed it. Then they got to calling this bottle cap U, because by that time the breweries had signified that they wanted to go open here. Well, when they started calling it bottle, bottle cap U, that rallied all the preachers in Tampa to get to our support. And, and so we had a really broad coalition going into all of this by that time. Uh, and I was exhausting myself running around in Paul Smith's airplane getting to all these meetings and, and, uh, and uh, making, making pitches and privately lobbying the members of the different boards that had to be, had to prove all this. Uh, fortunately, because I'd been in the legislature, they all knew me, and because I had made myself available to them and a in a friendly fashion, they trusted me, and uh, and I there was the always yeah, I was still in the legislature, and they recognize they would recognize me as these members as a member of the legislature wants to speak to us about this subject, and I'd always get introduced as a chairman of the committee of the House of Representatives that was considering all of this. So it uh, it worked out like that that uh, a lot of things were going our way. Well, we, a, a fellow by the name of, uh, oh gosh, I forgot his name right now, who, who had, was on the board of control staff, uh, had taken an interest in this, and, and we decided that we needed a formal resolution of establishment. And he knew a lot about how the Board of Education acted and what needed to be in the resolution. And I knew what needed to be in the resolution, I thought. 
And so we sat down in his kitchen with his very pregnant wife uh, one evening and drew a resolution establishing the University of South Florida. Of course, we didn't call it the University of South Florida. We still call it a four-year degree granting institution. Where in, was his house? In, 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 in his house was in Tallahassee on Pensacola Avenue. Uh, and it, I remember he, the fact that he, he wasn't very well paid, but he had a, he and his very pregnant wife had a nice kitchen and they had a light hanging from the ceiling on a cord. And I remember sitting around the kitchen table with him uh, uh, before we ate supper uh, drafting this resolution. Um, I'll think of his name in a minute. Uh, and we ran it past the staff of the Board of Education. We ran it staff past the, the technical staff that had to accept title to the land and all of that. So we had pretty good staff understanding and support from a technical point of view for it. And finally, on September the, on December the 17th, the Board of Education met. They came to this on the agenda. They considered the resolution. Uh, they deliberated the resolution, and they finally voted and established the university. Well, with that, it's all done. Now all you got the piece of the land, and no students, no faculty, no administration. And so I drew up a budget to submit to the next session of the legislature. The Board of Control believed it was going to be funded, and they believed it was going to establish, and they began to talk with me about who ought to be the new president. We ought to designate a president real quickly and get the new president on the ground and, and get him to sort of pull this thing together from an academic point of view and an educational point of view. We've got the other stuff. We've got the ground. We've got the political support. We've got the board's resolution actually establishing it. And uh, and uh, we, uh, we we got to get something. And so Dr. Allen's name came up during that conversation, and I enthusiastically supported Dr. Allen because I had worked with him. I knew he was so competent and so and such a fine educator and such a fine gentleman uh, that he would add dignity as well as experience and as well as the technical knowledge of what you got to do to put the university together. Remind me what he had been doing. He had been time. he had been the acting president of the University of South of University of Florida. Uh, when the president died, he was the vice president. And he became the acting president. The agricultural interest in in Florida figured that though that the new president at the University of Florida ought to be an ag man, and they got behind Wayne Wrights to be the president, and so John Wright, John Allen. Uh, stepped aside so that Wrights could be president, he became vice president again. And Florida was a big university and it needed a vice president and he had, he had lots of experience and he was putting together a med school and all kind of things like that. Uh, so he was the best choice and was the logical choice and uh, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't talk with Dr. Allen about accepting the job but I was glad that he did. Uh, he knew of my support of that, and we were friends, and and it was just a perfect setup as far as getting it going. Well, we still had no money. Uh, we couldn't move Dr. Allen down here. Uh, he'd been designated as the new president of a university that didn't have any money. Uh, we finally got the county commissioners to put up a little money and give Dr. Allen an office in the courthouse down there and help him hire a secretary. Uh, and so by the time the Florida legislature went into session, we had a budget that I had prepared uh, for the university, and we had an acting president who was... Uh, sitting in an office down in the courthouse with the secretary and beginning to put together the academic plans for putting the university together. And uh, I went up to the uh, governor who was uh, the 
going to be the final decision in all of this and sat down with him and he kind of worked my budget over and he, he wouldn't give me any dormitories. Uh, he said, oh no, Sam, you know, you're going to have enough people around Tampa. They can commute to school. They don't need any dormitories out there. And I was kind of taken back and Tampa Chamber of Commerce was kind of taken back. No dormitories, just constructional buildings and some other infrastructure. Uh, and finally I got that budget through the Florida next session of the Florida legislature. I had a lot of trouble with a certain Florida member of the legislature of the Senate from North Florida. But Bill Shans, who had been a close friend of my father's, uh, and who my father had done a great favor for in helping provide the sales tax for Florida. Uh, helped me get it through the Florida Senate when he, we ran into serious opposition from a couple of senators who didn't want to see the University of Florida challenge, frankly. That was their motivation. And they looked upon this as a potential challenge to the University of Florida. Uh, but Bill Shands, who represented that area and was all for the University of Florida, called those senators aside and talked to them and said, you know, let's get we got to get this thing done. Thank you for your support of the University of Florida, but let's get this one done down in Tampa. And they stepped aside and let me get the money. So we finally had an appropriation. We had a president. And <clears throat> Remember what that first appropriation was? How much were you thinking about in, in that first budget? Oh, it was not much money. Uh, about, I think, $400,000, which just gave Dr. Allen enough money to begin hiring staff and to begin hiring architects and planners for the university. Uh, and no money for dormitories or anything like that. There was, there was enough money in there for, I think, the administration building, which only cost $225,000. Uh, the same university administration we have is that here 50 years later is a, it was a less than $250,000. Uh, we had some money in there for other buildings, uh, uh, but the whole thing was down the road still. But John Allen did a wonderful job in putting it all together, and he had such great, people had such great confidence in his integrity and his skill that I finally began just to kind of step aside and say, you know, Gibbons, your job now is to get the appropriations through. Don't get involved in the formation of the university. If they want to ask you a question, fine, but let John run it. And he did. And 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 I just sort of became a, a kibitzer uh, and watched him. And if he needed some, wanted somebody to bounce ideas off of, he called me. Uh, but he put it all together, and uh, it, you know, it, and finally in 1960, we opened for the first class. Uh, well, there was a dedication. Or oh something. yeah, yeah. And I want to, I want to run back. Uh, and, yeah, we, we, we all kind of yeah. You know, and the man that, that <laughs> came down from uh, Washington, that. Uh, was investigating. Oh, that, yeah, but that was after the school got to running. Uh, Kefauver. No, the, we're talking about the, the Johns Committee. That uh, oh. that was after, that, I was in, yeah. I think I was in Washington by that time, yeah. when the Johns Committee hit here. Right. Uh, yeah, I knew Charlie Johns real well uh, because he'd been in the Florida Senate. <clears throat> well, let, let, let's run back and, and and cover some of those early periods. I think it's about this time that there's a lot of building going on on the Florida Southern campus in Lakeland, and they get Frank Lloyd Wright's people. Yes, that's right, yes. Who's the architect? Tell me about the campus. Some would describe it as less than, uh, at least the buildings, as, as uh, less than ideal aesthetically. Well, Was there any sense of creating a cohesive look for Yes. It? John Allen had a number of preliminary designs. One of them was a circular design in which the, the, it had a very well-defined center, 
going out in spokes for around in a circle. He had all kinds of different designs, and they finally hit on this design. John Allen was a conservative person. He didn't have a big budget, so he had to get as much as he could for the money. There was no money for dorms, and that's an interesting story. After the, when I, I got together with some people, uh, John Germany, I think was a principal mover, and Scott Christopher, and we formed a little foundation, John Allen, Taught, taught us what he knew about foundations, and we put together called something called the University of South Florida Founda the Foundation. And we used that as a vehicle for raising money from the local population for dormitories. By that time, it was dollars for dormitories. By that time, everybody was so enthusiastic about what was going out here on the sand hill that. They, they, we oversubscribed the dollars for dorm thing. Our goal had been a hundred thousand or a hundred fifty thousand, and we went way over the goal. So the University of South Florida Foundation got a real shot in the arm by the surplus that we'd gotten from the dorm money uh, to be its down payment on its uh, basic funds. I, I was the president uh, of the. University of South Florida Foundation, or the chair, I don't know what, I was but something. Bruce Robbins and, 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 well, Bruce Robbins, who was my across the street neighbor and where, where we live, uh, who was the head of Robbins Lumber Manu Manufacturing Company over here by that time, had uh, gotten active in it. And we had a, a, a big community effort to raise dollars for dorms. In the dollars for dorms thing, uh, uh, we got around to the first. Uh, uh, opening of the university finally, uh, that legislature kept coming up with the necessary funds. It wasn't easy, but uh, it got done. By that time I had moved to the Florida Senate and uh, at, at the dedication or opening ceremony for the university, uh, Mr. Stanton Sanson, who had been the head of the company, who had donated this 700 and some acres over here uh, and who had gotten a road uh, built through his property, uh, uh, came to the dedication uh, and he said, Dr. Allen, there, there, there's no, no sign out on the road showing that this is the University of South Florida. And John said, well, the legislature didn't give me any money. So Stanton Sanson got out his checkbook, wrote a check for $35,000 and built the entrance out there. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, uh, I had gotten to, to um, Washington by that time and I had been in office a couple of months when, when my, uh, my lady who got all the visitors, uh, the appointment secretary uh, came in and said, uh, Mr. Gibbons, there's a fellow out here that calls himself Abe Lincoln that wants to see you. And I said, well, what kind of fellow is he? He said, well, he's a nice looking fellow. And uh, he said, Abe Lincoln? I said, Abe Lincoln? He's been dead a long, long time, <laughs> hundred years. Uh, and so Abe Lincoln comes in and he introduces himself. He says, I'm from the Veterans Administration. I'm their, their legislative liaison and I've come to see you. Uh, we want to build a another VA hospital in the Tampa Bay area and we want to build it next to your university and medical school. And I said, well, I'm sorry, we don't have a medical school. That's up in Gainesville, you know. He said, yes, we know, but that's not a good place for what we need to do. We want it in an urban setting where there are lots of veterans. And, and he, he said, I said, well, we don't have a med school. He said, well, we can try to get one. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll join you on that. And, uh, while they played no role in it, the fact that we could get a, if we had a med school, we could get a VA hospital uh, became an interesting thing. And I called Terrell Sessoms, who had worked for me when I was in the Florida Senate, and he was a Speaker of the House by that time. And I said, Terrell, we got an opportunity to have a good uh, finesse here. We can build a, a, a med school and get a VA hospital in conjunction with it. Can you get the VA hospital through the 
I mean, the, the med school through the Florida legislature. He said, well, Sam, I don't know. I'll try. And so he did. He got uh, the med school authorization through there. So we had a med school. We had a VA hospital. You got the legislation through the Senate? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 oh, you I, think? I think Tom Whitaker was the... Uh, was a state senator at that time, but I know that Terrell Sessoms was the Speaker of the House, and he got it through. He was the impetus for getting it put together, and getting it enacted and okay. and done. And I've forgotten who was governor at that time, and the governor didn't raise a lot of opposition. After all, the Speaker of the House is a pretty important person, and you're not going to cross him on something that's in his district. And so Terrell Sessoms. Uh, got the authorizing legislation for the med school, we got the VA hospital, and and you know the history of all of that uh, now. Uh, we've got a medical center over there. Right. I want to I come back a little bit, because there's, there's some things we, we've jumped ahead a little bit. Um, I had asked you earlier about how the name University of South Florida <laughs> got chosen. Uh, when many people think of South Florida, they think of Miami, Fort Lauderdale. How is Tampa, South Florida, in the minds of the way the name got chosen. I'm afraid I'm primarily responsible for that. There were lots of names suggested. Uh, I wanted a name that had a lot of geographic significance to it because I had to get money. And so I just decided that everything that was south of Gainesville was South Florida. And the Board of Control went along with that. It was controversial because of the same things that you said. Well, this is really not South Florida. South Florida is Miami. Well, no, it's not. Everything south of Gainesville is South Florida, as far as I was concerned. And so we got the University of South Florida name out of all of that. What were some of the other suggestions? Temple Terrace University, uh, Tampa Bay University. That's too small a geographic area. I had to have something that had big geographic significance because I had to get money from those folks uh, in the state legislature. People still ask me today about where did the name South Florida come from, and I said, you know, politically we had to have the attraction to get the support and the money from the state legislature, and so make it as inclusive as we could. Uh, not the University of Florida at Tampa, not Temple Terrace University, not Tampa Bay University, not something like that. It's got to have lots of geography so that people feel, well, that's part of my university, too. And uh, that's where it comes from, and it has, it has worked. So now, obviously, at that point, uh, Florida International, Florida Atlantic, Florida Gulf Coast, all of those were... They were way in the off end. Right. They, yeah. they had not even, Florida Atlantic had not even been considered until well after this was operating and going. Although the enabling legislation lay there, they just couldn't get the political support uh, to get it through the, yeah. the Board of, of Education. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit about, uh, did you come to campus regular during the construction phase? Did you have Oh, much? yes, I love to come out here. And, and, what what and was happening on this land? Well, the lots place? of excavations. They were putting in drainage. They were putting in uh, all kinds of underground conduits and things of that sort. And lots of little buildings were going up. Uh, the library was not a little building. Uh, it is now not the library anymore. Uh, over there, but the first library was a, was the largest building. John Allen said, you know, the library is the heart of the university. His first employee, other than his secretary, was a librarian. And, uh, but they put sand down there to uh, yes. lay it down. Well, I'd forgotten about that part of it. Thank you, boss, for bringing that up. Just at the time we were hitting the crucial stride in getting the board of control and the Board of Education to approve this site. Nelson Pointer's newspaper, the St. Pete Time, comes up with this headline stories on the front page. The new university site is full of potholes and sinkholes, and it's not the right place to build a state university. That was the essence of it. Well, that threw everything into confusion. So 
the county had to hire a lot of engineers and we had to pay for core boring of this site to prove that every building that was put on it wasn't going to sink into the ground as soon as it was built. And Florida's full of sinkholes. Uh, they're always in the newspaper. They're always occurring. And this site had some sinkholes around it. Not particularly on it, but around it. And uh, the essence was that this site is no worse and, and probably a little better than most sites in Florida as far as sinkholes are concerned. Yes, there is a very thick layer of sand here that everybody can see that goes down about 50 feet and then you get into a layer of compacted muck and then finally you go past that and you finally get into lime rock where the sinkholes are formed and yes there could be a possibility of sinkholes on the campus but generally speaking from all the core borings and the core borings were done <clears throat> throughout the place on a geometric diagram so that <clears throat> every place that could be a possible sinkhole was probably hit. It cost thousands of dollars of county taxpayer money just to bore this place and do the studies, but finally we got it all done and we got it in time so that the Board of Control the Board of Control would know that, have that information when they made the final decision and the Board of, of uh, Education had all that information. But um, in order to overcome the sinkholes, <coughs> and <coughs> they went to a spread type foundation on these and where the library is the way they they wanted to make sure that the muck that was about 50 feet down below the sand was sufficiently compacted so they excavated hills around here and they dug a big hole over on the northeast corner or southeast corner of the university that was already a bar pit over there and they hauled sand in here till they got enough sand stacked up where the old library is and to cr crush the muck underneath it 50 feet down to compact it so that the building would not settle and I don't think there's a crack in that building yet mm -hmm. they had a huge sand pile over there and that's so it looked like big sand piles lots of construction and the way the Board of Regents, uh, the Board of Control, picked the architects to do this, uh, they couldn't decide on one and they couldn't decide on two of this, so they said, well, every member of the Board of Control can pick one. So each Board of Control, and, but they must work together with Dr. Allen and come up with a common theme. So every one of the five original buildings, the uh, Admin. The, the administration building, the library, the, uh, the student center, and the uh, classroom teacher buildings over there, all, each one had five architects, did it all at the same time, all kind of coordinating. John Allen picked out the theme, and being a conservative in nature, he didn't want any flashy stuff or things like that just a little uh, enough architecture to them to make them pleasing and 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 keep it simple and 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 keep it all roughly the same color so there'll be some cohesion and and he uh, entered into uh, the design uh, quite enthusiastically I think very competently because all the buildings he put up have been very durable they're here 50 years later they're still being used principally for the same purpose and uh, uh, while there have been a lot of style changes uh, there have been no massive style changes in the campus I do like the way it has been, has developed it is now a more friendly campus at first it was kind of desolate and cold uh, because there was no shrubbery no trees no grass this was a very dry windy sandy sand spur patch cactus patch scrub oak tree patch uh, Dr. Allen got the students in the first class to plant these pine trees that you see around here now and they did some student improvement as well as the, the university has always had a good person as far as grounds are concerned and as the money has been available and as the time has been available the, uh, the, the uh, 
attractiveness of the campus has improved greatly. But they had a tough, barren site to start with here. Mm. And, and it, it, I am very pleased the way it has developed. Did you uh, get out to the opening day, the groundbreaking? Oh, yes, the groundbreaking occurred during my campaign for the Senate. <laughs> and uh, so you served two uh, terms in the House? Two, I served three terms in the yeah. House, uh, six, six, eight, six, six, I mean, years, six years, excuse years. me, yeah. six yeah. years, one yeah. term in the Senate yeah. before I went to the Florida, to the United States Congress. and. When I was running for the Senate, uh, uh, the groundbreaking occurred, uh, and, uh, and you know, I took the picture of everybody shoveling, and, and the buildings came up. And I won the Senate seat and uh, and uh, became a state senator for four years, where I was able to get along with the pork chop gang. Now let's go back to 1955. Because that's a crucial year in, in in my personal history. Let's stop for a second. Sam, we've got five minutes on the tape. It's almost noon. Do we want to pick this up next No, week? we won't. We want to it now? Okay. That's I don't know how long the story is. Well, it's a long story. So let's, let's, let's cut it off at this point okay. and come back the next time. Yeah, because I, I don't want to. Because it is this time the segregation breaks loose. Right. The abolishment of the public school system, the, the reapportionment battle starts in the state legislature. I'm a candidate for Speaker of the House. I thought I had that job won until we started into this sectional battle uh, that where they divide us between the big city folks and the pork choppers. And I was with the big city folks uh, because I represented a big city. Uh, and. Uh, it, it, and the desegregation, all those battles and everything else. We were lucky, I got to say, those fellows were enough of statesmen to forgive the political positions I was taking and still give me money for the University of South Florida. Uh, it, uh, it was, they were statesmen because I was infuriating a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> let's, go, let's, let's spend some time talking about that. Yep. Next week? Yeah. All right.